While browsing through NES games, you'll occasionally come across some that look different. They're black, they have a slightly different shape, and they're all made by the same company known as Tengen. Sometimes you'll even come across the same game in a gray cartridge as well as a black Tengen cartridge. So who was Tengen, and why did they make these weird looking video games? It all revolves around a big legal battle between two juggernauts in the video game industry. A case that would not only redefine laws, but change how third party developers made video games on home consoles. Let's take a look. In 1984, Atari was in trouble. The video game crash of 1983, brought on by a flood of consoles and poorly made games, devastated the once prolific company. At the end of the year, Atari had lost $539 million. Massive layoffs soon followed. Business deals were canceled. Entire divisions were closed or consolidated. In May of 1984 alone, 700 employees were laid off. Steve Ross, president of parent company Warner Communications, had seen enough. It was time to pull the plug and recuperate whatever losses he could. He came up with a plan to split the company and sell them for as much as possible. Atari was split into two, Atari Corporation and Atari Games. Atari Corporation handled the consumer products, such as their line of personal computers and video game consoles, while Atari Games had control of the coin-operated arcade games and software. On July 2nd, 1984, the majority of Atari Corporation was sold to Jack Trammell, the founder of the computer company Commodore. Although Trammell could have purchased Atari games for practically nothing, he had little to no interest in video games. His background was in computers. Warner continued to look for a buyer, as Atari Games was losing money and suffered more layoffs. The next year, Atari Games finally found a buyer. It was a Japanese man by the name of Masaya Nakamura, who owned a company named Namco. On February 4, 1985, he purchased 60% of Atari Games through his US subsidiary, Namco America, for $10 million. For Nakamura, it was a long-time dream realized. Atari was once the dominant game company in the industry, and now, he owned it. But his dream would be run by another man, the same man Nakamura sent to the United States to run Namco America. His name was Hideyuki Nakajima. In his book Game Over, David Sheff described Nakajima as unusually open. He was a spark plug in a world of staid and sober executives. In short, the perfect type of man to turn around Atari games. Nakajima even had a history with the company. Back in 1973, Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney were looking to take the distribution of Atari products international. Thus was born Atari Japan. Nakajima, a veteran of the Japan Art Paper Company, was named the general manager. In the beginning, it was a disaster. Atari Japan struggled to find distributions for their arcade games. They turned to another company for help, Nakamura Amusement Machine Manufacturing Company, or Namco for short. Nakajima asked Masaya Nakamura to help distribute the games in exchange for a cut of the profit. Nakamura agreed. However, Atari Japan kept losing money. Nakajima even had to use some of his own personal savings to keep the operation going. In the end, it was his own employees who were stealing money from the company. In a last-ditch effort, Nakajima flew to the United States to meet with Atari executives, begging to let him keep going. But Atari was losing too much money, and decided to sell Atari Japan to the highest bidder. At first, that was Sega, for a measly $50,000. But Namco saw this as a great opportunity to get into video games and agreed to purchase Atari Japan for $550,000 and the rights to distribute Atari games throughout the country. Nakajima kept his job, and within a few years, Namco would utilize the resources it gained from the transaction to become one of the biggest video game companies in Japan. They churned out hits such as Pac-Man, Galaga, and Pole Position. In 1978, with business doing well, 
Nakajima convinced Nakamura to open a subsidiary company over in the United States. He agreed, and Namco America was born. Their location? A few blocks away from the old Atari offices in Sunnyvale, California. Namco America licensed their popular arcade games to American companies, with Midway getting two big hits, Galaga and Pac-Man. Nakajima also struck up a deal to merchandise their games. Pac-Man memorabilia was everywhere nationwide, and Namco America made a ton of money. Now in 1985, it was up to Nakajima to save Atari games. He reduced the salaries of vice presidents and directors, froze salary increases for a year, and laid off 30 employees. Nakajima himself took a 20% pay cut. While he was able to get Atari games out of financial trouble, he had disagreements with Masaya Nakamura on what direction to take the company. Nakamura was hesitant to put more resources into the company, seeing them as a competitor to Namco. He also didn't enjoy the fact that Warner still owned 40%. In 1987, Nakajima and Nakamura came to an agreement. Nakajima, along with several employees and Warner Communications, would purchase 20% of the company from Nakamura. Nakajima would become the president and resign from his position at Namco America. For Nakajima, everything had come full circle. He was once working for Atari, struggling to make it a success in Japan, and now he was running it in America. He soon turned his eye toward the home console market, which had recently seen a resurgence with the Nintendo Entertainment System. At the time, Sega was not licensing games for their master system, and the Atari 7800, released by Jack Trammell's Atari Corporation, was barely doing anything. The NES was the way to go. But there was a problem. Atari games couldn't actually publish games under the Atari name, as Atari Corporation owned the rights to the consumer division. To get around this, Atari games formed a new subsidiary, known as Tengen. Nakajima came up with the name Tengen in a similar fashion as Bushnell came up with Atari. Bushnell and Dabney named Atari after a term used in the Japanese game, Go. The word Atari is used in the same way someone would say check while playing chess. Nakajima chose the word Tengen, which represents the center of a Go board. The origin of heaven. Getting your game officially licensed by Nintendo meant following strict rules and regulations. Nintendo wasn't taking any chances, not after the video game crash of 1983. Poor games littered the market, and this was their version of quality control. To become a licensee, you first had to submit your games for approval. Nintendo had the right to make changes such as removing blood or religious symbols. Once approved, you had to purchase your cartridges from Nintendo. The cost ranged anywhere from $9 to $14, with a minimum order of 10,000 cartridges. Companies were only allowed to make five games per year, and were to be exclusive to the NES for two years. Some companies formed subsidiaries in an effort to publish more games. Konami published several games under Ultra, while Acclaim used LJN. However, the most brilliant move by Nintendo was their lockout chip technology, which prevented unlicensed games from even playing on the system. Both the console and the game cartridge contained a security chip that spoke to each other with a program called 10NES. If they could communicate successfully, the game would play. Nakajima wasn't a fan of the licensing agreement, but he met with Nintendo of America President Minoru Arakawa and Vice President Howard Lincoln anyway. There was mutual interest between the two companies. Nintendo saw Atari games as a recognized brand, with a slew of great titles they could potentially bring to the NES. Nakajima pushed hard for a better deal. This was Atari, who basically invented the video game industry. Arakawa and Lincoln wouldn't budge. All licensees had to be treated the same. Although upset, Nakajima reluctantly agreed. On January 18, 1988, Tengen officially became a Nintendo licensee. Their first three games were announced that same year at the June Consumer Electronics Show. Gauntlet, Pac-Man, and RBI Baseball. After the agreement, Nakajima and Arakawa would frequently meet for dinner or play a round of golf, a nice gesture between two business partners. However, Arakawa noticed Nakajima was quite chatty. 
asking many questions about Nintendo's business and its distribution strategy to retailers. Not wanting to seem rude, and having good faith in Nakajima, Arakawa shared information. He had no idea that behind closed doors at Atari Games, engineers were working to crack the NES lockout chip. A year earlier, in 1986, Atari Games was aware of the strict demands of the Nintendo licensee program. Nakajima, along with other executives, were not fans. Nintendo was new to the video game world, and their demands seemed arrogant, attempting to control the market. Said Chief Operating Officer Dan Van Elderen, the way Nintendo did business was like Ford introducing a car that could only use Ford gasoline. Lawyers for Atari Games read over the licensing agreement to see if there was any way to make games for the NES without going through Nintendo. There was a way, but it all hinged on being able to get around the lockout chip technology. Engineers were given the task to reverse engineer the chip. After many attempts, they found no success. One engineer, Pat McCarthy, wrote, Unless there is a specific profit motivation, or there is a hacker available with nothing to do, I recommend that the investigation end here. It was clear that in order to reverse engineer the chips, they would need access to the 10 NES program. However, Nintendo had copyrighted the algorithm. Now it is true that anyone can walk into the copyright office and ask to look at copyrighted material, but for certain material, such as 10 NES, you can't take a copy with you, or even take notes, unless that material is the subject of litigation. Atari Games came up with a plan. Atari lawyers filled out a form requesting a copy of the 10 NES program, falsely alleging that they were the defendants in a case regarding the algorithm in the U.S. District Court of Northern California. In no time at all, Atari Games suddenly had a copy of the 10 NES program, obtained illegally. With access to the program, Atari engineers had no trouble at all reverse engineering the lockout chips. They created a similar chip that contained their duplicate 10 NES program and tested it in a cartridge. It worked. They dubbed their clone Rabbit. Atari Games' plan to circumvent the strict NES licensing agreement was coming to fruition. Tengen may have picked the worst possible time to become a Nintendo licensee. In 1988, the entire electronics industry was experiencing a chip shortage, simply due to high demand. Nintendo was hit hard. Because they manufactured every single game, they had to let all of their licensees know they would be getting fewer games than originally planned. Some companies were furious. The loss of sales would cut deep into their profits. Dan Van Elderen, chief operating officer of Tengen, asked if they could just find surplus chips themselves without Nintendo. Nintendo agreed, but only if Tengen would pay the difference in cost. The chips also had to pass their standards. After finding a supplier in the United States, Tengen submitted the chip to Nintendo for review. It was denied. One Tengen spokesperson claimed that due to the chip shortages and Nintendo's policies, they were only able to satisfy less than 10% of their demand. Nakajima saw this as the final straw. Nintendo's licensing policies were hurting their business, and they had finally found a way around the lockout chip. It was the perfect time to strike. In December of 1988, Atari Games sued Nintendo for antitrust violations and unfair competition for a sum of $100 million. At the same time, they sent out their new games containing the Rabbit chip to retail stores, the very first unlicensed games for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Tengen games are similar in size and weight to a standard NES cartridge. They have a curved end and two tabs to help you pull the game out of the system. Each game has the Tengen seal of quality and came in a box with its very own dust cover. Tengen only made three officially licensed games, but they also made unlicensed versions of them as well. The Tengen library was notable for their RBI Baseball series, which is considered the best baseball game on the NES as well as some good arcade games like Gauntlet and Rolling Thunder. They even published a few SEGA titles, such as Afterburner, SEGA on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Who would have thought? There was also the close relationship with Namco, which resulted in ports of Pac-Man, Miss Pac-Man, and Pac-Mania. 
Tengen even made their own version of Tetris for a little while before a court ordered them to stop distributing the game due to licensing issues. But we'll save that story for another time. After the 1988 Christmas party at Nintendo, Minoru Arakawa and Howard Lincoln received the news that Atari Games was suing them. They were completely blindsided. They quickly contacted Nintendo of Japan. President Hiroshi Yamauchi was clear. Atari Games and their unlicensed cartridges must be stopped. Nakajima met with Arakawa to discuss the lawsuit. He told him he never wanted it to come to this, but due to Nintendo's strict rules, he felt he had no choice. Nakajima offered to withdraw the suit. Let us do our own manufacturing, he said. Arakawa said no. The lawsuit would continue. Atari Games went to the media, accusing Nintendo of creating a chip shortage in order to keep prices high. Nintendo vigorously denied the claim, calling it absolute nonsense. For Nintendo Vice President Howard Lincoln, it was a total betrayal of their initial licensing agreement with Tengen. He stated, I thought to myself, you have no idea what you have taken on. A tiger who will skin you piece by piece. Nintendo quickly countersued in February of 1989, stating that Tengen had entered the Nintendo licensee program fraudulently, obtaining technical support and detailed information about retailers for the sole purpose of making their unlicensed games. They also sued for Tengen's sales of unauthorized and unsupported games on the NES, as well as patent infringement on their lockout security system. Later that year in November, they amended their suit, adding that Atari Games unlawfully obtained their copyrighted 10 NES program from the U.S. Copyright Office. All of the allegations and suits would be condensed into one case. It was only the beginning of a long, drawn-out battle between the two juggernauts. The media took their sides, the majority rooting for Tengen. Whom should the average consumer root for? Clearly, Atari Games. If it wins, certainly more cartridges and a wider variety of games will be available for users. If Nintendo wins, the negative consequences for the rest of the computer industry could be staggering. If the makers of hardware had veto power over what software gets made, consumers would suffer. Fewer programs would be available, and they would certainly cost more. The Atari game suit is an effort to open up the marketplace. Dennis Lynch, Chicago Tribune. Nintendo employed a strategy of intimidation outside of the courtroom, threatening retailers with legal action or cutting them out of supply if they sold Tengen products. Nintendo products sold consistently throughout the year for retailers, sometimes making up 50% of sales. For some, it was simply too risky to sell the unlicensed games. Retailers such as Toys R Us, Walmart, Target, and Circus World all stopped selling Tengen games. Atari Games filed an injunction in order to stop Nintendo from threatening its customers. Judge Fern Smith, who would oversee the entire case, ruled that Atari and Nintendo could not interfere with each other's customers. Both companies appealed, and the injunction was lifted. Nintendo continued to contact retailers. Despite the legal battles and retailer threats, Tengen was seeing good returns on its unlicensed games. Sales were up by 40%. In March of 1991, in the U.S. District Court of Northern California, Judge Fern Smith would decide whether or not Tengen had a legal right to sell their unlicensed games. It all boiled down to the rabbit chip included in every Tengen cartridge. Did it use an exact copy of the 10 NES program in order to authenticate with the chip inside the NES? Atari Games argued that they took the Copyright Office documents because it was ridiculous to think someone could reverse engineer a chip just by looking at papers. They felt they were entitled to, quote, self-help. They also claimed that the documents weren't important anyway, as they had already cracked the 10 NES program. But evidence suggested otherwise. The copyright on the 10 NES program was dated 1985. However, in 1987, Nintendo made some modifications to the program, deleting some unnecessary code. The rabbit chip contained the deleted code. 10 NES also had other functions, beyond just unlocking the console. The rabbit program contained those as well. It was clear to Judge Fern Smith that the program contained inside Tengen's rabbit chip was a direct copy of the 10 NES program. She ordered Atari Games to immediately cease producing 
distributing, and selling their unlicensed games, as well as recall all product currently on store shelves. Smith also harshly criticized the company for their actions. If Atari did not need copyrighted information in order to achieve its goal, then it should not have deceived the Copyright Office in order to bring the 10 NES code back to the lab. Atari decided to make its cartridges functionally indistinguishable from Nintendo's own games by admittedly copying more than was needed to make a game work on the NES console. A preliminary injunction is appropriate. Judge Fern Smith Atari Games would appeal, claiming the decision would force them to shut down Tengen, laying off 39 employees, a huge financial impact. Judge Fern Smith agreed and suspended her decision. Tengen Games would remain on store shelves. For now. On September 10, 1992, the case went to the U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. As a defense to their copyright infringement, Atari Games argued that Nintendo had misused its copyright of the lockout program, giving them control of games developed by third-party companies. They asserted that Nintendo's misuse of copyright should prevent copyright enforcement. They also argued that reverse engineering the chip should fall under fair use. The court disagreed with copyright misuse, stating, The record does not demonstrate, as a matter of law, that such restrictions restrain the creativity of Nintendo licensees. They did, however, rule that reverse engineering was fair use, stating, Reverse engineering object code to discern the unprotectable ideas in a computer program is a fair use. Ultimately, the court agreed with Judge Fern Smith's original decision. Atari Games had stolen the 10 NES program code and ordered them to stop making and selling their unauthorized 10 Gen game cartridges for the NES. After four years of litigation, the battle was over. Tengen ceased production of NES games and shifted their focus to other systems, mostly the Sega Genesis, which was gaining ground in the market share. Atari Games' accusation that Nintendo violated antitrust laws would be settled out of court. Although Nintendo won the battle, Atari Games' lawsuit ultimately brought about sweeping changes. The case helped establish the legality of reverse engineering, it also reformed how the Copyright Office gave access to copyrighted material. Their antitrust suit also got the attention of other companies. Jack Tremell's Atari Corporation also sued Nintendo for $250 million for violation of antitrust laws in 1989. Tremell claimed Nintendo's practice of console exclusivity for two years prevented Atari from getting good games. The case would ultimately be dismissed. In December of 1989, Representative Dennis Eckhart of Ohio urged the Justice Department's Antitrust Division to investigate Nintendo, citing unreasonable tactics to restrain competitors. This led to an investigation by the Federal Trade Commission. A year later, in October of 1990, Nintendo announced they had decided to ease their licensing restrictions, which included the two-year exclusivity rule. In 1991, the Federal Trade Commission and Nintendo settled the case. Nintendo was ordered to send $5 vouchers to any person who had purchased an NES game between June of 1988 and December of 1990. Nintendo dealers were now allowed to sell games, cartridges, and accessories at any price they chose. The case even reached the Japanese video game market. In 1989, Namco had to renew their initial licensing agreement with Nintendo, which originally gave them special provisions for being one of the first licensees. Nakajima's old boss, Masaya Nakamura, met with Nintendo President Hiroshi Yamauchi to discuss the new terms. Yamauchi refused to give Nakamura the special treatment he once had. Nakamura was furious and spoke out publicly against Nintendo's monopolistic practices. He also declared that Namco would begin development of games for Sega's latest console, the Mega Drive. Hideyuki Nakajima would run Atari games into the 90s. In 1994, Time Warner decided to fold both Atari games and Tengen into their new company, Time Warner Interactive. Around the same time, Nakajima announced he was changing his role within the company. But friends, family, and co-workers knew the truth. He was battling lung cancer and simply couldn't handle the responsibilities of running the company. On July 11, 1994, Hideyuki Nakajima passed away in Tokyo. 
Under Nakajima's leadership, Atari games aggressively attacked Nintendo's business practices. This eventually led to Nintendo changing their strict policies, which allowed developers to make their games on other consoles. This helped systems like the Sega Genesis gain a stronger foothold in the market share, creating a more open market. Without the battle between Nintendo and Atari games, the video game industry wouldn't be what it is today. That's all for this episode of Game and Historian. Thanks for watching.